Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and this is the Modern Masters Podcast. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. I'm so glad that you're with us today. We've got a real special treat for you. I know you are going to absolutely flip when you meet our guest and hear what we are going to talk about. It is just absolutely fantastic. But before we do that, if you could do me a favor and you can look right here and uh, hit the like button if you are watching this on Facebook and share it with all your friends, I would appreciate that. And then if you could also go over to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button and the fancy schmancy notification bell, that would be absolutely awesome. If you're a fan of the Modern Masters podcast, and I think that you are, uh, I know that you're going to love watching all the previous episodes with all of the fabulous artists that we have archived. Every single episode of the Modern Masters podcast has been archived on our YouTube channel. Over 40 interviews with today's absolute, no joke, top working artists today are on there. So check that out when you get a chance. I would absolutely appreciate it very, very much. And you can also check us out if you want more information about the Gagno Atelier, what we're all about, what we do, that sort of thing. You can check us out at our website, gagnoatelier.com and... If you are interested in learning about our main exhibit that is in the works right now, and you can follow along with the process uh, the entire way, you can check out that exhibit at illuminatedmessiah.com. So check those things out, guys. I know that you will appreciate it, and I think you'll enjoy it quite a bit. Get to look at all kinds of cool artwork, too. What's wrong with that? That's a good day right there. So let's talk about today's episode. Today, I have got an absolutely wonderful guest. And there are times, you know, there are times when you just come across something and it just blows your mind. And uh, there was a movie that came out in 2017. And it was a movie called Loving Vincent. It was about Vincent Van Gogh. And what an amazing movie. But it wasn't just a fun movie to watch. It had an interesting twist to it that made it absolutely fabulous. And to be honest, it sucked your soul right out of your eyeballs because it was a visual feast. It was just, you couldn't believe it. Your mind was just like, what am I seeing? And it was just awesome. And let me tell you about it. So imagine instead of watching a movie, you were watching um, an oil painting. Like the entire movie was this animated oil painting. It was absolutely just mind-blowing in in what you would see. And so we have with us today one of the artists that actually worked on that movie. And she's going to be coming on and she's going to be talking to us about her adventures making that movie Loving Vincent. And so without further ado, let's bring her on, our guest, Dina Peterson. Here you are. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I am so glad to have you on. I mean, I can't tell you what a fan I am of that movie. I watch it way too often. (laughs) Um, I I make all my students watch it. I make my students write papers on it. They hate me for that. That's what they do. And so I had one student, just to give you an idea, he fell asleep during the movie. So I made him write a paper on the movie he slept through. (laughs) Didn't go well for him. <laughs> that might have been even better. <laughs> he had a rough time with it. I'll put it that way. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, it's it. we watch it uh, every semester. I absolutely love it because uh, it gives it gives you that art history kick. But it also is such, like I said, it's a visual feast. It really is. And so I can't wait to talk to you about that. So but for, before we do that, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, you know, a little bit about your, your your story, your art career, what brought you to, you know, uh, being an artist and things like that, so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Well, that's great. Thanks for asking. You know, I've been painting for probably, gosh, almost 30 years now. 
I grew up in a really small town in central Illinois, and I, uh, I loved art ever since I was a kid. And a lot of artists say that, but I really did. And um, I went to a really small high school and they weren't, you know, art, my art was encouraged and I did great in art, but I was also a pretty good student. And unfortunately, I wasn't really encouraged to do uh, to go into art at that time, or at least there was this sort of bias in the small schools that if you were a good student, you don't go into art. And I got to say, some of the most brilliant people I've met since then and since my time in art are, are artists. So, um, so yeah, it was it was too bad it wasn't really encouraged, but I always did it. I ended up going on and getting a master's degree in counseling psychology of all of all things. Like that's really practical too, right? So um, I did work in that field for a while, but I always miss doing art. And then so I I had three kids and my ex husband worked quite a lot, so I kind of had to stop working. Then I raised my kids, which I'm I'm thrilled I was able to do, but. Uh, at that time, I didn't. I found that I didn't really miss working in that field too much, and I started exploring, getting more into my art. And I took a lot of really wonderful workshops from some really top people. Um, at that time, I lived in a town called Loveland, Colorado, and they used to have a really great art academy. It's not there anymore, but I took a lot of great workshops there. Richard Schmid used to teach there. Um, so yeah, I was fortunate to keep pursuing it anyway, and um, just got more and more serious about it. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I've been I've been working at it pretty seriously for a while now. I've been teaching and um, done a lot of workshops and so on. So, mm. well, that's great. Um, so you you got to um, learn from the Schmidt. <laughs> that, that's pretty no, cool. No, I, I didn't yeah. technically take a workshop with him, but I sneaked in on one. A friend of mine brought me uh -huh. in so that I could observe. So yeah, door, got huh? to meet him, you know. I saw a lot of movies in. that way. Saw a lot of yeah. movies that way. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep. So that's great. So but so you were in one field, but you wanted to be in this field. And you know, that that's the thing about, you know, when you're growing, I grew up in a really small town too. There's more moose than people where I'm from. And <laughs> You know, and it is one of those things where it was like most people couldn't wrap their brain that lived there around the concept you can make a living as an artist, you know. And, right. and even, even even now, I mean, I bump into people and you tell they ask you what you do. Oh, you're, I'm an artist, and they assume we're starving to death or right. on welfare or this or that. And it's like, you know, uh, the whole the whole thing of the starving artist. It's such a myth, but people just don't understand and they don't they freak out, I guess, over it. And it's like, you can make a wonderful living and have a great life and support your family and do quite well as an artist. If you do it the right way, there's a right way and a wrong way to do anything. I could go start an ice cream shop and fail miserably or be a millionaire tomorrow. That's right. It's all about, it's all about your mindset and how you handle it and how you do your art career. So yeah. you have had quite a, quite an interesting art career though, because you ended up going into the movies. You went Hollywood on us. Well, not actually Hollywood. You went you went uh, European on us. Right. And so you were a big part. Now, when I was on your website, it kind of billed you as an impressionist artist, as, as, your, as your genre, as your style. And so you were kind of perfect for the Loving Vincent movie being, you know, him being, you know, the poster child for the impressionist movement. And, but... You also do other type of work too. You were saying that you're getting more into non-representational art and other things. So I can't wait to talk to you about, about that. But let's go ahead and start with the journey of loving Vincent. And then we'll go on and because I want to hear about, about what you're doing now too, because that's always fun. Um, because that was 2017. And you're probably working on that probably two years, probably 2015 or or earlier, possibly. 2016, actually, yeah. Wow, 2016. So that that shows you how long it takes to make a movie. What mm -hmm. I'm going to do is I'm going to show for you guys watching. Um, we're going to show the movie trailer for Loving Vincent, and that'll give everybody an idea of what the movie is and what it looks like and things like that. And you can actually find it quite easily um, if you go on YouTube. You can buy or rent it right now. So, um, but I'm going to play this uh, Loving Vincent clip, and then when we come back from that. We're going we're gonna to talk to you about your journey on how you became a part of that. So here we go.
Vincent van Gogh killed himself. How does a man go from calm to suicidal in six weeks? Vincent left this letter. Theo van Gogh. That's Vincent's brother, isn't it? I don't see the point in delivering a dead man's letter. So, if you had died and there was a letter out there that you had sent to me, I'd want us. So, what brings you to Orver? I want to do something for Vincent. You're not going to stir things up again, are you? I've had quite enough weeping over that nutcase. His neighbours and the police Get out! and the whole town <laughs> against an ill man. Vincent, what have you done? We all knew something was very wrong. Vincent! If only I could have been one of them. Great artists are not peaceful souls. That is the price of your path. Is it worth it? Did he change his mind? Did he want to live after all? You want to know so much about his death. What do you know of his life? What did you do for him? I would like to show by my work what this nobody has in his heart. Your loving Vincent. And there we go. Wow, that was pretty impressive. Uh, when I said it was a visual feast, I wasn't playing or messing around. That thing is amazing. I remember the first time I watched it, I was like, I just kept getting closer and closer and closer to the TV. And before long, you don't even realize you're watching an animation. It's just so flows and it's so beautiful. But this was like the first animated oil painting that I had ever seen. I know that. I don't know if it was the first one ever, but what an amazing, an amazing movie. How did you get involved with this project, with this project? That, yeah, that's what I get asked the most, you know, and I still watch that trailer. I still get chills. I'm so proud of my work on that. And one of the scenes that they showed a clip of was my favorite scene that I did was when the crows are flying out of the field. But yeah, it was actually the very first full length, uh, hand painted animated film, very first. So that's what made it so unique. And I think that's why I was disappointed it didn't win the Academy Award, it was up for one. Uh, because I, you know, it was, it's, it was such a long process and an arduous process for the ones who were involved. Um, but anyway, yeah, so how did I get involved? I'm like you, I saw the trailer I, well, not that trailer, but I saw bits of animation on Facebook. It was kind of going around Facebook and I was fascinated by it. And I thought, well, they've probably already finished it by now, but I'm going to watch for this. And they actually hadn't because in the beginning, what they did was they put out bits of what they'd finished so that they could attract investors um, and get the, them interested in supporting the work because these were independent filmmakers. Um, the director, Dorota Kobiela, is a Polish woman and she she was trained in Warsaw as a painter, first and foremost, and then she got into doing animation, but she'd never done a full length film before. She'd right. done some shorts before. Um, she subsequently met uh, Hugh Welchman, who's a, a British uh, film director. He'd done an animated short called Peter and the Wolf that won Academy Award in 2008, I believe it was. So, so they met working on another project together. They eventually married, but they worked on this film their whole marriage, at least up until the time it was finished. So that was about seven years it took. Um, seven so years. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, yeah, so I, I saw the animation. I was immediately hooked. I love Van Gogh. And um, it was my middle daughter, actually, Emily, who, who um, asked me if I'd seen this animation. I said, yeah. And she said, well, mom, I went to their website. They're still looking for artists to help them finish this film. And I was really surprised by that. She said, you should apply. And I thought, okay, well, you know, my youngest one was off to college and I thought, let me look into this. So I did visit the website and there wasn't really like an application, but I sent them an email and some of my images, you know, linked to my website and so on. And 
you know, it was just a shot in the dark. I thought, well, I'll just see what happens. I didn't know anything about the film. I didn't know where the film was being made, nothing. Right. Um, and I was shocked to find about two weeks later, I got an email from them that said, we think you might be a good fit for this project. And you need to come and take a test to see if you can do this. And also it's in Gdansk, Poland, <laughs> you know, and like, I'm from a small town. I really hadn't traveled. I think I went to Europe once, but you know, it wasn't something I, I never actually thought of going to Poland. And then when I heard that, I thought, okay, the first thing I said to my daughter was, you know, what if this isn't a real thing? What if this is some kind of scam? I don't know. I'm kind of a natural skeptic. So she said, well, mom, what's the worst that can happen? You've, you've gotten a trip to Poland if you go. And I thought, you know, she's, She's smart. Somebody raised that girl right. So, <laughs> yeah. So I did it. I, I mean, they didn't pay for us to come. I bought a round trip ticket to Gdansk, Poland. I found the film studio. They put us up in a hostel. I had a roommate who was another woman about my age. And the test, the testing period was about three days. And so what they did was they real quick trained us. And we were all just painters. We weren't animators. They trained us on the computer software, you know, it, it didn't use computers, it was all hand painted, but we had to have a way to capture the image and put them all together. It's like old school animation. You, you do the painting, scrape off what's gonna move, you repaint it, you take another photo, put them all together and it looks like it's moving. So it's really old school, but they do use software so that we could watch the animation and so on. So we had to learn all of that stuff. And I'm kind of an old dog, you know, most of the, the painters, I think, were much younger. There were a few of us that were in our 50s, I think. But so anyway, they taught us quickly kind of how to do this, how to use the equipment. They had these little stations set up in the hallways of this big warehouse. And we animated a scene with Armand, who's the narrator, you know, the yellow jacket guy adjusting his tie and so on. And it wasn't used in the film, but we were just, they wanted to see if we could get this. So it was terrible animation. I think it was three days, we did a couple of scenes, but I mean, I don't know, we did maybe, you know, 12 frames all together, which is about a second of footage. And at the end of that, um, I went back. I mean, I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll just wait and see. I didn't really expect to hear back. I had bought a round trip ticket and then I got a call about a week later and they said, you did a great job. You're in. When can you come back and start training? Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. So I went back. I, you know, I had to talk with my husband about it. And, you know, we had to put this all on credit cards. It's like, uh, he's a pastor. I'm an artist. You know, we didn't have a ton of money, but we talked about it. We said, you know what? This is like an opportunity like no other. I mean, I just couldn't say no. So I went for it. Um, and it turns out, I think about 5,000 people applied to do this and only yeah, about 120. Yeah, about 125 made it. Mm. So we did this three week training period to train us further and practice further in the learning the animation part. And and even then they they lined up uh, they lined us up in the hallway and um, read off our names to to let us know whether we made it or not. So I felt like as when I was on Top Chef or something, you know, okay. pack your brushes and go. And I made it again. So through the second hoop and so. There I was, they thought it'd be a couple of months. It ended up, I was there about six months. And at about the time I finished up, they, I think it took maybe a couple more months to actually finally wrap up all the animation for the film and they were doing the post-production stuff. But what a journey. I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was unlike nothing I've ever done in my life, you know, just just learned an amazing amount of stuff. I have a new appreciation for animators of all kinds, um, but especially those old school ones that did it all by hand. Right. And yeah, I, I'm just glad I took the risk. I, I, I'm a pretty safe person, but if I hadn't said yes, you know, none of this would have ever happened. So. Well, that's a beautiful comment right there. You know, sometimes all it takes is a yes. You know, figure. You don't know how it is. Say yes, and then you'll figure out. Mm -hmm. go, go for it. You know, I think sometimes if we just say yes more often, opportunities are there, you know, and, and it's sometimes it's important to be able to be willing to take the leap. That's you it. Know, you had your daughter there that encouraged you to do it. That's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. 
Uh, you had your husband who was like, go for it. You know, I mean, that, yeah. that's having, having surrounding yourself with people that believe in you and, and are going to encourage you to go for it. But it, you are still the one that has to say yes. ultimately. <laughs> and when you get an opportunity, go for it. You know, so many, so many people. And, you know, when we talk about, we, we were talking about earlier, you know, the, the, the thriving artist versus the starving artist. Sometimes it, what makes you that thriving artist is simply the word yes. And then, well knowing, said. you know, and, and that, that's probably the biggest advice that, that I've ever taken to my life. And that I hear from artists like yourself that have done these amazing things and had these incredible opportunities. It was that ability to say yes. So yep, absolutely. I said yes. Cause I, yes, love, me it. Too. I love that movie. Oh my gosh. And so I'm going to watch it again when, when, I, when we're done. It's going to happen. Great, great. <laughs> it's going to be like, oh, great. We get to watch it again. Yes, we are. <laughs> but so talk to us a little bit about, so you move out there and you, you're there and you don't, you literally don't know anybody because no. you're in another country and thank goodness they speak English there and, and probably about Most 10 other them. languages. Yeah. And so you don't know anything. You're there. Um, obviously they're paying you to do it, but still it's a whole other ball game. And so that's going to be pretty intimidating. That's going to be pretty just, I mean, that talk about being thrown to the wolves and you have to basically learn animation from scratch. Yep. So yeah, it was a totally, totally foreign situation in so many ways. And I have to say on the plane trip over, well, both plane trips over there, I bought one of those little books a little language guide to Polish. And I'm not, you know, I've not had a lot of foreign language. I think I had a semester of French in high in college. Um, but I, I, I told myself I would at least learn the basics because I think it's out of respect. You go to someone else's country, you can't expect them to speak English. And honestly, a lot of the younger people spoke some English, but when I was out and about in the community, most people did not speak any English. So I had to learn a few basic words to communicate. I was real proud of that. And, and then some of the Polish uh, artists that I worked with would, would teach me a little bit more, you know, and uh, so that was fun. But yeah, it was a completely different culture. But the cool thing about it was is, um, you know, one of the things Hugh Welchman said was that he believed that they could teach painters to animate, but they couldn't teach animators to paint. And so I really felt like that was quite a compliment to artists, to real painters, because Dorota herself was a painter. She was trained uh, as a painter there in Poland. And I thought that was a real tribute to, to painters because it takes a lot, a lot of years to learn this stuff. And um, I, I think to be a really great anim animator, it does take a long time too, but, um, you know, I got I got as good as I could. Let's put it that way. Right, right, right. Yeah, they're they're both such different genres, um, and they have their their totally different skill sets. But yeah, paint, painting is in and of itself such an insular thing that that you know it's a skill set. And and mm -hmm. when you're when you're working on painting to be a great painter, to stop and then I'm going to learn this whole other genre that's totally completely different. It was. And, and you had mentioned something that surprised me. So you didn't paint, like in normal traditional animation, they have background painters that do nothing but paint backgrounds. And then they have the character animators that, that animate the objects and then they put them on top of the background. So the background's moving and the animation cells are moving. And so they're separate, but you were painting the, back, the whole painting and then you would scrape up, I'm assuming this was all done with oil paint. Mm -hmm. you, you scrape off the parts that were being animated and then you would repaint those. That's quite a different way of animating, not just animating, but it's, you know, a really strange way to animate. Yeah. So it, scraping the paint off. Yeah. It was, it was fascinating. It, it was, you know, we would start, we all worked on the same size board. I think it was 60 to a hundred centimeters or something like that. And we would, we would paint it um, basically with a color that would resemble the color of raw canvas, for instance. And we do that with acrylic, but then everything else on top of that was oil paint because it had to be flexible. We had to keep moving it, working with it. And the thing was, we would, 
we would paint the, what they call the first frame of the scene. And once we got that right, we could then go ahead and animate. But sometimes the first frame, like the wheat field with crows scene that I did where Armand is throwing a stick in the field and the crows fly away. Um, the director, Dorota, was really picky about that scene because that's one of her favorites. And I was honored that she chose me to paint it, first of all, um, but we had to get it right. So the colors to our naked eye were very different than how they looked on screen. So what we had to do for every scene, we had to match, we had to put the color on the board, take a photo of it, put it into our computer screen, and then judge the colors based on the screen, not our naked eye. So often they were very different. Like Armand's yellow jacket actually was a very kind of a greenish color um, mm. to the naked eye, you know? So we had to do test shots of all our colors for faces, for, for the painting, the whole thing. And um, we had what they called um, like scene painters in the very beginning that would sort of, they would paint like, a painting of Armand or Dr. Gachet or Van Gogh or something like that. And we, we would sort of try to match their colors, but everybody had to paint everything. We didn't have one person painting Armand. We didn't have one person painting Gachet and so on. Right. So we had to all kind of match those colors as much as we could so that it wouldn't look weird when different animators were painting them, you know? Right. So it was fascinating. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, I bet. I'm going to show a picture so that so that the uh, viewers can see what this is the workstation. Um, and so you have a, you have the paint, the painting there on, on the uh, table mm -hmm. and then you have the monitor above. So you would I, I'm, I'm taking it like that's the almost like an onion skin. That's the animation cell, the frame before or the frame after or is it this frame? How did that work? Well, we could check our we could put our. Our, we take photos of our work each time we were done animating that that frame. And so we could put it into the software and we could check it. So we could look, we could toggle between the frame before and the few frames after to see if our animation was smooth, to see mm -hmm. if the colors were lo looking right and so on. So that's what we would use that screen for. Um, we also, it, it's sort of hard to explain, in the beginning of the film, they filmed the whole film with live actors on a green screen. Yes. So, so like, they, like they had, yeah, exactly. So they had some footage of the actors moving and we could use that footage, could project that onto our board to help us animate, but they didn't have the painting's background. So here you see uh, Pere Tongui and Dr. Gachet, you know, they were moving on, against a green screen, but we had to fill in the you know, all the background and also animate them in the style of Van Gogh. So that's kind of how it worked. Amazing. Yeah. And, and that, that was one of the things about the movie that really, that really impressed me was how it was made. So you could see, so the actors were project that, that image with the actor on front of the green screen, you could project it onto your canvas and then you would paint almost like if you were painting on a light table. Yeah, absolutely. So and we could see sort of an outline. It wasn't great. We couldn't really see colors on our board. So um, we'd have to use the colors based on those first frames that a lot of the, the beginning painters did before any of us even got there. Right, right. Amazing. And it had quite quite a cast. I mean, it was an impressive cast. It was, um, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. So you're sitting there and you've got, you've got, so the way that the movie was billed is they filmed the entire thing in front of a green screen with all the actors. And then they gave it to 120 artists mm -hmm. and you each had so many scenes that you had to do. And I believe that the movie ended up being 64,000 individual paintings. Yeah. I think the last I heard was about 65,000. Yeah. That is just insane. How many, of course that's 24 frames per second for the entire movie. And yeah, the the, the film was actually we did we did two frames per let's see. So we did I think it was 12 frames for one second of footage. Okay, wow, interesting. So I figure I did about I, I tried to add up, I did five scenes for the film, and I I think I figured it was gonna end up being about 20 seconds of footage. <laughs> so you know, but 20 seconds of footage when you're doing 12 frames a second is a massive amount of paintings. It was so, a lot of paintings. And that, and that leads me to um, 
like, for example, myself, I paint 48 pet portraits every week. Wow. Every week I have for but they're small. They're only six inches by six inches. And I, and I, and I knock them out and I know how long I spend on them. And I know for me, I know exactly how much money I spend on them versus what I charge for them. And so I know everything about those pet portraits. I, I can break it down into the, into the pennies and not just mon monetary wise, but also on my time on mm -hmm. how long I spend on that. How long did a typical frame of the movie take you to paint? You know, it really did vary depending on the how complicated the scene was. Right. So um, strangely enough, I besides the wheat field scene, I did two close-ups of actors. I did the gendarme and I did Armand in the garden when he's talking with Gachet. And when you're doing a close-up, you know, it's it's not just the features that move, but all the strokes in the face move. So you got to move each stroke the right amount and not too much. But you also have to remember to um, one of the animation terms I learned was called was called boiling. So even if something didn't move very much, like say his torso didn't move that much, mm -hmm. you didn't want him to appear to be sort of frozen in time and have only his head move. If he's a, a living, breathing human being, you know, his torso is going to move a little bit. So, and same with the gendarme. So every time he's speaking and moving, you know, you have to touch that paint just a little bit on his jacket. And then especially those darn ropes, he'd lean over to talk and those, all those things move. The epaulets on his shoulders would move. So um, it really depends on the complicatedness of the scene. Now, now the background wasn't moving in this case because he's in a police station. Right, but on something like this, it must have been yes. moving like crazy. Well, yeah, because you're outdoors. So all the crows are moving, he's moving, but also the wheat and the, the clouds in the sky, you know, there's ever so subtle a breeze when you're outside. So you touch, you know, every other frame or so, you touch a little bit of the wheat or you touch a few strokes in the clouds to make them not look static and frozen. Like in the old, like Bugs Bunny animation, when they just sort of, they sort of move the background, but it doesn't really change. So it was very, um, it was very uh, complicated animation. And my supervisor, Piotr Dominiak, was one of the heads of painters. He was a Polish man and he taught me so much about animation. And one of the things he said about animation is that animation equals concentration. Um, whereas, you know, when I paint, I'm concentrating, but, but a lot of times, you know, I, I'm sort of just painting. I'm not really thinking until I go back and I sort of use the judge to sort of decide if it's working or not. With this, you constantly have to be paying attention to what's moving and what isn't or not to move it too much or to move things the right direction. And so I didn't get to your question, but it depends on the scene. But I would say, you know, a frame for me would take me an hour and a half to two hours. Um, okay, and that, that was working pretty fast. I, that's a lot faster than I thought. Yeah, um, but not the first frame. The first frame always, like the first frame of the wheat field scene, because it's based on his famous wheat field with crows and it has to be right. You know, the colors have to look right. right. So I would say that took me nearly a week to get that right okay. before we could start the animation. And the director, Dorota, she had her finger on everything. She wanted to see almost everything before we could just go on and animate. And she'd, she'd check her animation all the time. So amazing, amazing. Yeah. So that that I mean that what a what a fascinating process. So you're sitting there and you're and you're trying to paint it to look just like the Van Gogh uh, original, and then so you set up that scene, and I, this is this is the painting, and then you got to scrape off sections of it and start painting the animation. Yes. And and my gosh, and so at that point, so you weren't now on a scene like this one again. You're painting the figure the birds flying and then every now and then you're, you're doing a few things in the field or in the clouds or things like that. Yes. Um, so you're not painting the entire painting from scratch. You're painting sections of the painting. Exactly. A little bit at a time. And then with something like this, and I remember this scene, um, well, there, if I remember that scene, there was a lot going on. It seemed like, it seemed like even the background was moving constantly as well, even mm -hmm. though the person is speaking is really moving a lot more. Um, 
when, when I was watching the movie, it just seemed like every single, every, it looked as if you were repainting every frame in its entirety, the way that it was done. The other thing that, that, that blew my mind on, on the movie was how every artist, every scene, the art changed. It wasn't the same exact art style the whole movie. Right. Like every, and, and it, to me, it was like every character had their own style. And I, if I remember correctly, every time we would go to actual Vincent Van Gogh, it went to black and white. Mm -hmm. If I remember in the movie correctly. And that was a, that was a, it was like a visually a, a very subtle and yet dramatic change. Yes. To let us know we're in the past and that this is about yeah. this now. Um, it was because it was black and white, it was darker. Mm -hmm. which kind of lent into his his personality and, and his uh his uh the things that he was struggling with and uh he was such a tragic figure and mm -hmm. so it was beautifully done but wow what a fascinating thing to just talk about how how you had to put together that movie um and you had never done animation before never probably even thought about animation never yeah so, you were, were you like not even a Disney fan with Disney animation when you were a kid? Oh, you know, I love, I love Disney, especially, I love old, especially the old school animation, you know, and after I did the film, I visited, uh, my husband and I went to visit the Walt Disney Museum in the Presidio in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And and I, I think I had a new appreciation for all the, um, they have a lot of the animation cells there and a lot of exhibits that show kind of how it was done and the, you know, the ink and painters club. And yeah, so it was, I think I appreciated it more having done the film than I ever did before. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm, I, I've always been a, a Disney fanatic and uh, uh, I love on how Disney plus they have the old, they have all the old uh, behind the scenes of the, and they have yeah. a lot of documentaries about the original animators yes. and different things like that. I love to watch those kinds of shows. And uh, in Disney World, I live in Florida, obviously. Um, Disney World in Florida, uh, they have a section in Hollywood Studios, which is like all, it's in in the Pixar section and it's all the animation. Hmm. And, and you can look at, it's, it's an art museum for their animation. And then of course, Disney World has their art of Disney art galleries that you can visit and go to that are absolutely uh, amazing. A lot of, a lot of people don't, a lot of artists don't even know about that. Yeah. I don't, I didn't know about it. So. Yeah. Well, that's one of those things. That's an opportunity to say yes to if you're out there. There you uh, go. Is that they are always looking for artists to submit work, to become a Disney artist, to have your artwork in the art of Disney galleries. It's, it's always there. And as a matter of fact, I was just on uh, the website uh, for, uh, the Breakthrough Films, which is right here, breakthroughfilms.pl. Um, if you go to their website right now, like if I were to scroll and go to their website right now, the first thing that pops up are, do you want to be an animator for us? And send us, click here, and then it gives you a upload your portfolio. Oh. Tell us about yourself. So they're, they are right now looking for animators and painters. That's great. Yes, they, ha they are working on a new film right now. I, I, I've just seen it because I follow them on uh, Facebook and Instagram. But I think it's called the, um, uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of it, but uh, it's about, um, I think it's called The Peasants. And it's going to be painted animation. And I'm not sure about the plot or anything like that, but. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I'm almost tempted to want to go back. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. It sounds fun. You know, what What a, what a fabulous opportunity, you know, to do that. Yeah. The fact that your family supported you to go to, because you had to go by yourself alone. Yes. Yes. And you ended up being there for, it was, wait, tell me again, it was supposed to be how long and it ended up being six months? Yeah, they, they thought it might be a couple of months, but it just takes so much longer than than they even could imagine, you know, and they come, they came up with, well, you know, you showed the picture of our little cubicle. When they first started, they had this big warehouse and all these cub cubicles were out in the open and they realized they couldn't control the lighting and everything. So it ah. took them like probably a good couple of years just to kind of figure out the best way to do these workstations. So they call them pause and they came up with this painted animation workstation. And so what they did was they learned to bolt down the board so nothing would move. You know, they've got a uh, apparatus behind us with a camera and a projector on it. 
all bolted down because it's got to stay, you know, in the same format and it can't move. Yeah. So it was really ingenious. It allowed the painters to focus more on the animation and not have to worry about, you know, setting up a camera or anything like that. We could press a button and take a photo of our work as we went along. So. Oh, wow. And, that, and that's a big, that's a big thing, you know, just being able to sit down and work. And I don't yeah. have to worry about this. You know, uh, I, I do a lot of videos, obviously, and setting up the cameras and stuff, uh, building a setup and doing it, it, it could be a pain, you yeah. know, and to have all that done for you. So you just had to sit down and work. They did it all yeah. for you. That's fantastic. What a, I mean, just it's such a such cool dream opportunity. And uh, I'm hoping that some of our some of our viewers will check that out and dive at the opportunity because, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, if that opportunity, you got to experience it. Other people can experience it too. They just got to say, yes, that's like a yep. theme for today. we got a theme. Who knew we were going to have a theme for right. today? Right. Just but say yes. Just I tell you, yes. if I can do it, anybody can do it. Trust me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. So that was one opportunity. And you did that in 2017. And it was nominated for an Academy Award. It didn't win. Who won that year? It was Probably. Coco. Remember the film oh, about? Oh, you were going up against Coco. Yeah, which was pretty you know, amazing. You know, yeah, no one, no one can defeat the uh, eight hundred pound mouse. Right know? there, you, you go. Know, you're not going to be. You know, it's just golly, you know. And it's a shame because it was an incredible, loving Vince, absolutely incredible movie. And I hope that our viewers check it out uh, when they get a chance uh, immediately because it's that good. But yeah, going up against Coco, how do you? Oh gosh, how do you? Right. Compete? Disney, you know, but at the same time, you guys did, you gave them a run for their money. That, that yep. goes without saying, well, let's show some of your more recent stuff. Some of your other work that you do. Uh, you've got some beautiful artwork right behind you. Even I can see, uh, write something on your easel. I always like to see what's on the easel. That's right. the, fun yeah. stuff. That is the best stuff ever, but let's take a look at some of your artwork. Cause you do, you do, uh, a lot of plein air paintings, um, uh, we were talking before, before we went on the air about, uh, how you worked with Eric Rhodes, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, plein air, um, society that he, that he works with, uh, you spoke there. Uh, then you have, uh, you do a lot of still lifes and you do portraiture, uh, you do it all. And now you're getting into representational art, uh, as well as you are an instructor. And so mm -hmm. there, there's a ton of stuff going on. Let's take a look at some of your artwork. And so people can really see your style. I'm going to show, um, let's start with this portrait of this beautiful uh, young lady here. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Stop it right now. I love the brush strokes. Tell us about this darling right here. Well, this was something, actually, this might be a different version, but this was something I um, was asked to do for Eric Rhodes for Streamline Publishing. Uh, Lila Dahl uh, D art DVDs. And um, he had asked me to come to Austin, Texas and do a couple of DVDs on uh, painting like Van Gogh. So I did one that was a landscape and one that was a portrait. So this was a model that um, I had photographed at an art show that I was attending years and years ago. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to do something in Van Gogh's style and and I did a landscape at the same time and he divided it up to put them into two separate DVDs. Um, but yeah, Eric opened up some doors for me. He invited me to come speak at the plein air convention in San Diego a few years ago about my experience working on the film. And uh, it got a standing ovation. I was blown away because I'm kind of an introvert. I was really, really nervous. <laughs> and uh, I've since been asked to speak quite a bit about my work on the film, but yeah, of course, I don't, I mean, I don't always paint like Van Gogh. And I, I always remind people that really only Van Gogh can do Van Gogh. And so um, I think it's, it's great to learn his technique, um, to learn, if nothing else, what people learn is to use more paint, because I teach a lot of beginning painters. And oh, one of the things they do is they will not squeeze out any paint. You just nailed it right on the head. You <laughs> yeah. just, I tell, I tell, because where I teach, I teach, uh, I teach art. Uh, at, uh, at my local college here, uh, Gulf Coast State College. And uh, we have a program called the Encore Program and it's, and it's for snowbirds and retirees. It's twice a year and, we're, and I teach you know, a painting class. 
And but there are like 40 classes that they can take. And they're they're taking my oil painting or acrylic painting class. So it's it's acrylic or oil paints and, and we're painting. And they will put so much water or so much medium in their paint mm -hmm. that I tell them, like, look, if you want a watercolor, go take the watercolor class. Absolutely. Because this is oil paint and acrylic paint, and you got to slather it on like butter. And they, right? they, they're like, no, I can't. I'm like, put the paint on your brush. And There's so much fear of, you know, and somebody said to me recently, it, it, <laughs> nothing happens with paint if it's left in the tube. You know, you can't do anything with paint. Yeah, when Even on the canvas, out, if there's not enough on there. Right, so they thin it out so much, they might as well be water paint. Right, right. A water paint class. Put and you know, paint. I've always, I think even, even in my early days, I, I used to paint a lot more representationally and I used to do a lot more plein air stuff. And even back then, I always liked using a lot of paint. And I don't know if that's what they saw in my work, you know, for the film, but I've always liked seeing where my brush has been in my work i you know with oil paint i like seeing the paint i like to see the texture of the paint well, that's just me painting that looks like a painting i want that painterly look to it you know i want to see the viscosity of the paint that's yes. heavy impasto and the brush strokes and the yep i don't want to see the texture of the canvas right i want to see paint right that's that's what that to me that that those are the paintings that i just love the most they look like a painting you know there can yes. be thin areas of paint and there can be thick areas of paint there can be everything in between exactly but you're right most uh most beginning artists they paint so thin yeah oh. they squeeze so, out this this much little paint you know yeah, and then they use this much water or medium or whatever it's like right. oh, what are you doing but you know that's that's a young young artist so van gogh taught you to put it on thick Load yep. it up. Don't be shy. I love that. I love that a lot. All right. Now we're going to show your next painting here. Now this one is uh, just reminds me of home, the beach. You know, I'm from New Hampshire, but I've been living in Florida a long time, mostly because I'm old, but I've been here a while. And these are one of my favorite birds because they're kind of like me. They're loud. They're proud and they ain't shy. And <laughs> They're the seagull. We have a saying down here in Florida. It's happier than a seagull with a French fry. Oh, that's hilarious. And I love animals. I love birds. And, you know, I, I just wanted to paint. I just wanted to make a simple statement with this painting. Um, you know, you can see the brushwork, but just light and shadow. I'm kind of a light and shadow painter. Funny enough, Van Gogh really didn't paint light and shadow so much, but but that's me. I love the shadow, the stark shadow. You can tell it's a sunny day and just, um, yeah, trying to trying to use an economy of brushstroke, I would say, not not overworking something. That's that's the way I like to do it. So. Right. Yeah. It's, it, 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 and I think that's one of the things I love about it the most is it's is it's both complex and simple at the same time. It's almost it's almost abstract in a lot of the shapes. Thank you. And it's just, and I, and I love the cool versus the warm that, that you see that contrast there. And plus the bird, you know, he's just relaxing and chilling yeah. and sleeping on a beautiful sunny day. It's getting a suntan and that's what we do in Florida. And yeah. I know, I know that's a Florida seagull because he's just the happiest. Yes. Yeah. Waiting so for that, that French fry. Yeah. He just had a French fry. He's happy. And uh, that's uh it is beautiful, beautifully done. Thank you. Beautifully done. And so let, let's look at this next one. Now, this one is this one is just absolutely gorgeous here. This is your uh, still life of uh, some some flowers. Tell us about this gorgeous piece right here. I love the complementary colors, the orange and the blues. Well, thank you so much. This one's called Orange Array. And I don't know, about a year ago, I started experimenting a little bit with adding cold wax into my oil paint. Oh, really? And okay. Yeah, so this just, you know, you get some amazing texture. Um, I actually painted over an old oil painting that I wasn't happy with. And then I, I, you know, kept some of the flowers were already there. So I just sort of abstracted it a little bit more and, um, you know, just, just went with, you know, abstraction and realism. I mean, realism has abstraction to it so yeah. you've got to have a good strong abstract design to have a good painting no matter how you paint 
So that's that's what I was going for here. And I was looking for the complementary colors and just the interesting textures that came up with it. So yeah, it's one of my favorites that I've done more recently. Yeah, and I think that 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 that's the key. It works for me on on, on those two levels. You have the basic abstract which is very much like the, like the seagull one, very abstract painting, but yet there's so much going on here. And then you have, you know, so you have the complexity with the simplicity when it comes to the abstraction, but also all the things that are going on in the flowers and the leaves and the stems. There's a, it's like, it's implied detail in there. That's, it gives the, I'm going to say the impression of, <laughs> which is the whole thing about impressionism. You know, it's, it gives the impression that there's a lot more going on there than there actually is. It's, and then that's, what's so beautiful of it. But then you have the complementary colors that just make, it makes the blues deeper and richer and it makes the, the flower heads just explode with, with the complementary colors. So I, I, I do love it. it. It's the simplicity with the complexity and they just kind of, go like this and, and, and nail it with it with just a powerful image. So well, good thank job. You so much. roll, thank rock you. and roll. It's just, yeah, I'm really loving it. Really loving it. I love, you know, that's the best part about this show is I get to, not only do I get to meet artists and make all kinds of new friends, but I also get to look at some of the best art in the whole wide world. All I the appreciate time. that. Thank you so much for appreciating what I'm trying to do. You know, it's, it's <laughs> funny. I have to say working on the film and, I really, I mean, we didn't have to, we, you know, to paint like Van Gogh, we had high resolution images and we could really zero in on his brushwork and really study it and try to replicate it. But I also really got into learning more about, excuse me, about his life and just his thoughts. And I listened on tape I, or on audio. I listened to uh, his letters to Theo and uh, I just really felt like I, got into his head a little bit and really enjoyed learning more and more about him. And so one of the things that I thought was interesting was that he was such a groundbreaking painter. I mean, he was, he was even post-impressionism. I mean, he was doing stuff that the impressionists weren't even doing. And, you know, so then I, I mean, it really affected me in that I feel like, you know, I sometimes ask myself if Van Gogh were alive today, what kind of stuff would he be painting? And I really think he would be, he would be moving beyond realism like he did. And he'd probably be getting into more non-representational stuff, you know, and it's, I think it really inspired me to say, you know, you got to find your own voice. You got to figure out who you are and what you love and, and go for it. And I got to say, I, I would say even a year or so be before I did the film, I was just getting a little bit tired of strict realism in painting and, even plein air painting, which I love, it sort of made me feel like I had to paint what was in front of me and I had a hard time sort of standing back and interpreting. So I had to take a little break from that and, and say, you know, what can I say about this that's not just copying it? And that's what Van Gogh really taught me to do, I think. Oh, wow. That, that, that is so powerful what you just said there. Finding your artistic voice. Yeah. It, by far the most important thing an artist can do, but it's also the most difficult sometimes because we have our art heroes. We yes. have what sells maybe yep. might not necessarily be who we are. And there's that period of finding us and, and trying to be a working artist. And there's so many factors and finding your personal voice. You know, it's like God made you, you mm -hmm. didn't make you me. So why would you, you didn't make me Van Gogh, Gogh either, right? Right, and you're not Van Gogh, but right? Van Gogh, you know, and and you know, Van Gogh, you know, he's he was a, he was a tragic figure, but he was an innovator. And what was it? He sold one painting in his entire career. One. Yeah. So by worldly standards, he was a complete failure, and yet today he's considered one of the greatest painters that's ever lived. He is the most parodied and copied artist period in the yes. history of humanity um his 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 legacy is so far beyond anything he could have ever dared imagine right. and it was all because he dared to be himself to be himself he stayed true to his style even though he you know people weren't loving it at the time he stayed true to what he was seeing and that's right. 
that's why it's sort of ironic that I get asked to teach people to paint like Van Gogh because it's, I mean, there's a part of me that's hesitant because it's like, you know, I can teach you how to do impasto brushwork and maybe you can incorporate, incorporate that in your work, but ultimately you've got to be you and do what you, and it takes years to figure that out. I'm still working on it. You know, well, I think, I think as we get older, it gets a little easier to, to get comfortable in your own skin. But again, yeah. for an artist, we have so many ar other artists that influence us that you yes. end up looking like them. So how do you get, how do you let yourself shine through? And I always go back to the whole point is, is that I look at art for me, uh, you know, as a man of faith, I look at it like God made me an artist and my art and my style of art there may be people that paint like me, but nobody paints like me. Yes. And for me, I look at it as it's like a fingerprint. Yeah. And and just like I can see certain artists and I know exactly who that who painted that mm -hmm. because I know their work. I recognize it. Well, I look at it like God knows my artwork. And so I need to paint for an audience of one, him, and just let me shine and the rest will fall into place. And I look at it like, you know, if your grandkids, I don't know if you have grandkids or not, but mm -hmm. when, when, when your grandkids make you a picture, yeah, you that thing, you lose your mind with joy. Yes. And where does it go? It's, it is magnetized to your refrigerator yep, on the fridge <laughs> for all time, for yep. all time. You know, I remember I drew a picture of my dad and I fishing when we went to, uh, we, we had a, a hunting cabin in the woods. And we, and it was just a solo trip, me and dad, I was probably eight years old. And I drew a picture of us fishing at the beaver dams. We hiked for like three hours in the woods to these beaver dams. And we caught well past our limit. And then we hiked all the way back and we cooked the fish. And I drew a picture of us fishing and it said, for dad love Timmy. And I spelled for F-O-U-R. So for dad. Yeah. <laughs> and he looked at that thing and he loved it. And he nailed it to the wall on the cabin and it stayed there until, I mean, I was an, an adult and there was a fire and, and the cabin was burned to the ground. If that wouldn't have happened, it'd still be there. Right. Because that's what parents do. And mm -hmm. so I look at it like your paintings, my paintings, God's going to bring us into heaven one day and make our, make us a sandwich in the, in the kitchen. You're going to see your paintings on God's refrigerator. <laughs> I love that. You know? I love that thought. And and to me, that is a beautiful thought. But he doesn't want your paintings of Van Gogh. He wants your paintings done by you because exactly. that's what he wants. And that's what he put you on the earth for. And, and it is. To me, it's an act of worship to, to paint me, paint what he did put in me. You know, get in your own skin. And I think that if an artist that can find themselves – and get comfortable with that and then develop that they will find success i agree that's so rare these days it shows when you paint from what's in your heart and we can all learn to copy stuff that's what the ateliers are for and everything and that's great but you got to do more than that and so when you paint what's in your heart it shows that you you're excited it shows and i think other people will love it too i got to believe that because yes. i tell you even Leaving the representation club is hard because I was trained in that too. I was trained to, you know, copy what I see and try to match colors exactly. And aren't we glad Van Gogh didn't do that, you know? So it's like, you know, it's, it's, you got it. You, you just got to be excited about what you're doing. And, and if, if you are, then I think it, it's going to show in your work and people are going to love it. I, I think you're right. I think that art has this, Art has a way of connecting the viewer with the artist on an on a heart level, yes. on a spiritual, emotional level. And it connects, it connects with people. And people are desperately looking for authenticity. That's and there is it. nothing more authentic than just being comfortable in your own skin, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. Nobody's comfortable in their own skin. In the world of social media, everybody is presenting a lie to the world. Because yes. we don't show the good stuff. We don't show the right. bad stuff. And, and so, you know, if you're one of those people on Facebook that's always posting depression and sadness, guess what? People unfriend you or unfollow you and no one sees your stuff. So we're always in this pursuit of likes and follows and shares and all these things that we're not being authentic. And then 
But when people are authentic and truly deeply authentic because they're comfortable in their own skin, people notice that and they're attracted to that. And art that is both good art and what I mean, you know what I mean when I say good art, I mean, it's got that professional polish to it. It's got that, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the difference, you know? Yeah. Um, and so when you have really good, solid, skilled art, that's also authentic, boy, that makes a difference. And that's people, a powerful combination. Yes. And people are drawn to that authenticity. They're drawn to that mm -hmm. uniqueness. They may not be able to put a word to it. They may not be able to say what something special about this person's art. It's the same genre as that person's art, but there's something special about this person's art. And I feel it's that authenticity. I really do. I agree. I that thing. So, boy, well, I'll tell said. you. Dina, this has been a fun conversation and seeing all that beautiful art. Uh, I just can't thank you enough for coming on. This has been just absolutely fabulous. And uh, I just want to thank you for coming on. I've got your website right here. Dina paints. <laughs> com. It doesn't get more right to the point than that. I love it. <laughs> uh, so I hope that my viewers, you guys watching, you need to go and you need to check out Dina's other artwork check out her stuff, buy up all her paintings because they're all, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's some beautiful stuff. And you, how, how could you not want some of these beautiful paintings in your home? They are absolutely fabulous. She also has, if you want to learn how to paint like Van Gogh, she's got a series on how to paint like Van Gogh on her website. You can check that out. And if you're interested in uh, learning about uh, the film, Loving Vincent, you can go to BreakthroughFilms.com. If you're interested in becoming an artist for their next movie, you can go on their website. You can check that out. And uh, they are always looking for help, apparently. So that's cool. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. So you can watch Loving Vincent and you can see Dina's artwork moving around. <laughs> How exciting is that? So Dina... Thank you again uh, for coming on. I'm going to say goodbye to the audience. You stay on the line. I'm going to say goodbye to the audience and I'll come back and I will talk with you. But again, thank you very much for coming on the broadcast. Thanks for having me, Tim. I appreciate it. Well, guys, wasn't that a great episode? My goodness, wasn't Dina fabulous? Not only a fabulous artist, what a fabulous story. and What a great person. I just absolutely loved her and loved her story to death. So uh, with that said, guys, check her out. Go to dinapaints.com today and check her out. And also, if you want to be an artist like her and you want to say yes to an opportunity right now, breakthroughfilms.pl, uh, they're looking for artists right now. You should check that out. You should totally should. What, what's the worst that could happen, right? There you go. You may just step into your destiny. So with that said, guys, uh, do me a favor, as always, if you can uh, like and share this broadcast, if you're watching us on Facebook or if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit the notification bell because the Modern Masters podcast is about to have our best year yet. And every episode from last year has been archived on the channel. So if you want to see some incredible interviews like the one we had today, check it out because you will not be disappointed. You can also check us out at thegagnoatelier.com and you can learn all about our latest exhibit over at illuminatedmessiah.com. So with that said, guys, as always, you know the drill. God loves you. And so does your old pal, Tim. We'll talk to you next time.